Today we will learn about non-compete clauses by examining the case of data management versus green. Non-compete clauses are increasingly relevant in our economy. The extent to which they should be enforced is the subject of our lesson today. Before we turn to the facts of the case, let's talk a, a bit about non-compete clauses. A non-compete clause, or a covenant not to compete, is a provision under which an employee agrees not to enter into or start a similar profession or trade in competition against his or her employer. Why might an employer want their employee to sign a non-compete clause? Well, the main reason is that employers may be concerned that their employee uh, might reveal confidential information, trade secrets, or marketing strategies. Uh, employees, of course, sign non-compete clauses because it's a condition of employment for at least some employers. In cases where employees have some leverage, they might sign a non-compete clause in exchange for a higher salary or benefits of some kind from the employer. Employees might be willing to give up the freedom of working for a competitor in order to get a good job that might provide them with some extra training or hands-on experience. But a non-compete clause that's too broad, either in its temporal or geographic scope, might prevent an employee from finding any alternative employment uh, in their chosen field. The facts in data management versus green are simple. Defendants and employees, Green and Van Camp, signed a covenant not to compete against plaintiff and employer data management in Alaska for five years following their termination. Shortly after their termination, defendants began to compete with the plaintiff who sought injunctive relief. The trial court granted a preliminary injunction and then summary judgment in favor of defendants. The instant court clarified the law to be applied and remanded the case. There are two main issues in this case. The first is whether the covenant was overbroad and therefore against public policy. The second is whether the covenant as a result of its overbreadth is completely unenforceable. On the first question of whether the covenant was overbroad and therefore against public policy, the court answered yes. Under English common law, overbroad covenants not to compete were under unenforceable under the public policy doctrine. In effect, preventing covenants that are overbroad sets a ceiling or a cap on, uh, on their length. Covenants not to compete must be reasonable with regard to both their length and their geographic scope. There's a mandatory ceiling on, the, on this scope. In this diagram, you can think of uh, there being a mandatory uh, ceiling on the maximum duration of the covenant and uh, not to compete. The court finds that the covenant uh, uh, not to compete for five years goes beyond this cap uh, and goes into the non-contractable zone. This immutable ceiling is similar to the treatment of unconscionably high markups and the treatment of unconscionably high liquidated damages uh, amounts uh, that operate as penalties. In these other contexts, the law also places mandatory caps on the markups or the price or on the size of liquidated damages. But the default rules are very different in these, in these different contexts. The default duration of a covenant not to compete is zero years. If you leave out a covenant, then there's no duration. It's, you can immediately compete. But the default price is a reasonable price, not a zero price. And a default damages are expectation, not zero damages. So from these examples, you can see that contract law uh, can not only decide what a default rule is, but it can also limit the alternatives to the default which the parties can choose by putting on ceilings or floors and, or somehow limiting what other options they, they go for. Why is the mandatory ceiling imposed here? Well, one reason is that restraints against labor raise thir 13th Amendment uh, type concerns. Recall that the 13th Amendment banned slavery and involuntary servitude in the United States, 
One argument is that the covenant not to compete are unconstitutional restraints on people's ability to provide their labor in an open marketplace. We also don't want a former employee to become a ward of the state. If employees are laid off and can't find another job because of a covenant not to compete, they might have to rely on social uh, security payments or welfare payments of one type or another. This means the rest of society picks up the tab for uh, the non-compete. Generally, when you see a mandatory limitation on freedom of contract, you should ask whether the limitation can be justified in terms of externalities or paternalism concerns. You can argue that both are in play here. After the court has found the covenant to be overbroad, it must address the second question, what to do with the contract? The court opted to reasonably alter the covenant to make it enforceable. The court has three main approaches to a covenant that is overly broad, that goes beyond the mandatory ceiling. First, the court can choose not to enforce the contract at all. This court does not like this approach because it, quote, may produce unduly harsh results, unquote. But you might argue that we want harsh results for deterrence purposes to deter employers from putting in overbroad covenants not to compete. The court's tone reflects its attitude about the nature of the employer's and maybe the employee's behavior. This may be a context where employers actually know the law and the risk of overbreadth. Second, the court can use the blue pencil test. The blue pencil allows alterations only by the deletion of specific words in the covenant. The court rejects this approach because it's too dependent on the language of the parties that the parties happen to use. The blue pencil rule is a very mechanical rule, but because some courts rely on it, parties might consider fallback language indicating that the covenant will be enforced for the longest period possible. So a party might say, a covenant might read, this covenant lasts for five years or for the longest period allowed by law. The blue pencil rule arose because courts are disinclined to rewrite contracts to add in their own language into it. With the blue pencil rule, courts don't have to write any new words. They just have to strike offending words. Sometimes a crafty court might be able to strike a word or even just a digit. For instance, a 10-year non-compete clause might become a one-year non-compete clause by striking the number zero. The last approach, the one adopted by the court in green, is the reformulation of the contract to a reasonable breadth. In this case, the court adopts this approach and, uh, unless the contract was not drafted in good faith. If it was drafted in bad faith, the, the contract wouldn't be enforced altogether. When parties violate a mandatory limitation, there are two generic legal responses. First, the law can substitute the provision that comes closest to what the parties contracted for. That result is depicted in this slide by moving the parties to a covenant just below the mandatory cap. Alternatively, the law can punish one or both of the contractors for violating the mandatory limitation. That result is depicted in this slide by moving the parties to a covenant with zero duration. It's a poor length with regard to an employer's preferences than what the employer might have been able to contract for. Non-compete clauses also appear in the sale of a business. Well, why would a buyer and seller of a business want a non-compete clause? Usually, the vendor of a business will promise not to compete with the purchaser to ensure the value of the business being sold. For instance, suppose that Robert sells Sally his bakery. Sally will likely demand that Robert sign a non-compete to not open up a new bakery next door because that would undermine most of the value of the bakery salary Sally just bought. The covenant not to compete has been the source of prolific litigation. An Ohio court once wrote that there is so much authority on non-compete uh, 
that it can be compared to a sea that will drown the legal researcher. U.S. jurisdictions approach non-compete clauses differently. While the majority of U.S. states recognize and enforce various forms of non-compete agreements, a few, such as California, show great hostility toward the enforcement of covenants not to compete. In general, courts focus upon two aspects of a covenant, whether it protects some legitimate interest of the promisee and whether it's reasonable in scope. When it comes to the sale of a business, courts tend to be more favorably disposed toward covenants that are ancillary to the sale of a business than toward those that restrict an employee's competitive activities. A covenant ancillary to the sale of a business is usually seen as protective of the goodwill being sold. With respect to the employee's covenant, where the party does not have a special or unique skill, the usual attempt is protect by precluding the use of trade secrets, confidential information, customer lists, and the like. The reasonableness test deals primarily with the area and types of companies covered as well as the duration of the covenant. And it is here that efforts are frequently made, as in the instant case, to convince a court that the excessive parts should be excised, leaving intact that which is reasonable both as with regard to space and time. Efforts are thus made to sever or divide the legal portion from the portion which is illegal. The geographic scope is increasingly problematic because in the internet age, many manufacturers find themselves competing uh, online with producers from anywhere in the world. In summary, a non-compete clause or covenant not to compete often appears in an employment contract or a sale of a business. Non-compete clauses cannot be overbroad and against public policy. If they are overbroad, a court may choose to not enforce the clause entirely, delete certain provisions using the blue pencil rule, or reformulate the contract to what would be reasonable. Reformulation is often the preferred approach because it's not overly harsh and is very flexible.